All right, so I wanted to do something that I haven't quite seen yet here on YouTube, and that's a video that details every single parameter and every single setting for the Steam Controller that is offered through the Steam Controller software. Because some of these settings are extremely confusing, and the explanations that are provided are extremely poor, and it's impossible to make heads or tails of anything that you're reading. Uh, not every parameter is like that, but a lot of them are, and it can be very confusing. And some of the parameters that are p poorly worded are some of the ones that you're going to want to need in order to improve the functionality of the device. So my goal here is to try to provide you with knowledge and insight as to how the goddamn thing works so that you can better customize it and create better profiles for yourself and create a more comfortable gaming experience. Because let's admit, it is an awkward device to use, but it can be very comfortable if it's configured correctly. And Steam or rather Valve, doesn't really make it easy for you because a lot of the explanations for all of these parameters um, are very poorly delivered. So let's just jump right into it. We'll start off with the triggers. So these are dual stage triggers, which means they have two buttons. They have two actuation points. There's a soft pull and a hard pull. The soft pull initiates one action and the hard pull which is uh, clicking past the floor so you push all the way down and then there's a floor and then you push even further and then there's a click these are two different actions that you can assign to these two different parameters so you can assign an action to the soft pull and then you can also assign an action to the hard pull now you might be asking well that seems really useless because what if I want to use the hard pull without the soft pull we'll get into that so you have the full pull and soft pull actions and you can assign these to whatever you want along your keyboard, your mouse, or a controller if the game is expecting a controller. You just find whatever input you need for a specific action and then you can assign it to whatever input on the controller. This screen will come up often and I will probably reference it often, but I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of explanation because it's very self-explanatory. You have a bunch of inputs, you assign whichever input you want to any button on the controller and it'll work very self-explanatory. So you can assign controls for this hard pull and soft pull. So here we have the soft pull trigger style and then the soft pull point. The soft pull trigger style is not actually the first parameter that we're going to look at. The first parameter is going to be the soft pull point because it's actually more relevant. And it's the first thing that you should probably try to understand before you start messing with these. So you have your trigger. Let's say that's the trigger. And this is the point right here where you have the hard pull. So you're going to be pushing the trigger down that way, right? The soft pull point is basically the threshold. So you have a threshold here. You can push the analog trigger all the way down. But once you get past that threshold, then the soft pull action will execute, if that makes sense. So now we have the soft pull trigger style. And in this menu, there are a bunch of parameters but they all pretty much define, in one way or another, how the trigger behaves once you've passed the actuation threshold for the soft pull, the soft pull point, the threshold. Once you've passed that, how is the controller going to respond? How is it going to behave? So say you have your trigger again. And there's the hard pull right here. That's the floor. So you're, you're pushing up toward the controller, toward the hard pull, and your threshold is right here. Simple threshold is basically, once you get past this threshold here, you have all of this play and you can move the analog trigger in and out as long as you're within that threshold and you won't stop sending that particular soft pull input to the game. So you can go back and forth as long as you're within this threshold and it'll be fine. But the second you cross the threshold, the input will cancel. And that's the simple threshold. Then you have hair trigger, which behaves a little bit differently. What it does is you can go in this direction and you can keep going in this direction, but any, any movement in the opposite direction, even if you're past the threshold, will cancel the input. And the reason this is useful is because if you have 
this trigger set to firing and say you're in the game and you're firing a semi-automatic pistol and you need to be spamming this like crazy every single time it registers going in the opposite direction the input cancels that way you can spam it as fast as you can and you will always be getting input after input after input you will never be stuck in a in a particular spot so it's actually really useful for something like a first person shooter if you want to be able to shoot as fast as you can pull the trigger hair trigger is the way you want to go so now we have the hip fire options and these operate completely different these are based on time how much time can you spend past the threshold before the soft pull action is executed so if you pull down the trigger and you go past the threshold based on which one of these parameters you choose you will actually have a certain amount of time before the soft pull is initiated the action assigned to the soft pull is initiated if you have it set to aggressive you have very little time to spend in this little window right here before the soft pull is initiated and these hip fire options basically what they're for is to allow you to hip fire because if you have the iron sight assigned to the soft pull and you have your fire button assigned to the hard pull well you don't always want to use your iron sight you want to be able to skip the soft pull entirely and that's what these options allow you to do if you pull this trigger down fast enough with one of these options enabled you will skip the soft pull entirely and go straight to the hard pull and you will say if you have this assigned as your iron sight you can actually skip the iron sight altogether and just go straight to hip firing and that's what that's for if you have it set to aggressive you have a very small window of time before the soft pull action initiates but each one of these all the way down to exclusive and exclusive is a little different each one of these just increases the amount of time that you can spend after the threshold before the soft pull is initiated now hip fire exclusive is a little different basically what it means is that once you're past the threshold once the soft pull action has been initiated the hard pull simply won't work so you can either pull it down fast and skip the soft pull and then get a hard pull or you can pull it down slowly have the soft pull initiate and then the hard pull doesn't work at all and that can be useful for some scenarios uh, the trigger analog output basically what this does is it allows you to assign which trigger is affecting which input in the game if you want the left trigger to actually do the right trigger in the game well you can assign it to either left or right trigger or you can sure you can choose to turn the analog completely off where the soft pull no longer is sending analog information it just becomes a button and the hard pull not that it sends any analog information but it also just becomes a button so you have two buttons right here so that's analog off and I think the software is still receiving analog information so that the soft pull trigger style will still work however as far as the game is concerned it's only getting inputs that are like buttons it's not getting any analog input if that makes sense um, the haptic intensity I guess I can just explain briefly what the haptics are almost every single part of the controller offers tactile feedback either through a vibration or some kind of oscillation inside of it uh, there are tiny actuators inside that kind of give you a, a buzzing sensation under almost every single one of the inputs it's fine to turn them off and you really don't need most of them except I find it extremely useful to have haptics on the right trackpad and that's it I generally turn them off everywhere else because I don't like the whole entire controller vibrating in every single di different direction while I'm playing so for the right trackpad haptics are fine but haptics basically are the tactile feedback on the controller uh, the hold to repeat um, with some games that don't have a con you know, like controller support and have really poor keyboard functionality even though they're expecting to use a keyboard um, a game like Dead Island would be a good example it had horrible keyboard support but playing with the controller was also a nightmare so what they did, or rather what the fans of the game did, was they created a third-party piece of software that actually edits uh, the game in such a way 
that it changes the keyboard parameters. The repeat keys actually caused a whole bunch of problems with that game, and people thought that they were getting micro stutter in the game, but no, it was actually just poor uh, key repeat management by the game itself, causing the camera to look really janky. And for games uh, that have those kinds of poor parameters, you can actually set the, the repeat key, which is called turbo mode, you can set that on. I think uh, Xbox controllers actually have a similar feature. So you can set it on and you can set the interval. The interval is basically how many, um, how many keystrokes per second it's actually sending. So how many inputs per second is actually sending. So the, the higher up it goes, the more inputs it's sending. Right now, it's by default, it's pretty high. You can actually set it lower if, you, if, if need be. I can't think of a scenario where you'd need to set it lower. I can really only think of scenarios where you'd need to send, set it higher. But if you needed to, you could set it lower, and you can set the intervals right there. Let's go to advanced settings. Uh, this test to zero through five, I have no idea what those are, and as far as I can tell, they don't do anything. They don't even have descriptions. They just have, um, it looks like file names. So I'm assuming this is just leftover junk that's left in the software from when they were developing the controller and they were just too lazy to remove it. So here we have the trigger range start and trigger range end. And so let's draw another trigger. There's your hard click right here, or your hard pull. And then you have the trigger right here. I realize I keep drawing it and it looks kind of like a tit, but that's okay. So you're pulling it in that direction, right? You have your end point, your start point, and then your threshold. And you can adjust these up and down however you want. You can shorten the range, you can widen the range. It's already as wide as it can go, but you, relatively speaking, you can shorten it, you can widen it. And basically what it does is it creates dead zones wherever you want the dead zones to be. And a dead zone is basically a part of the input or uh, a place along the analog input where no information is going to the game. So you could think of this as the outer dead zone, you could think of this as the inner dead zone. If you're thinking about it in relation to something like an analog stick, when it's in a resting position, you're in the inner dead zone. When you have it bottomed out to one side, you, you're in the outer dead zone. So it's kind of similar here. This would be the inner, that would be the outer, outer and you can change them and expand them and squeeze them however you want. So if you want, if you want it to be really, really short, you can configure it so that the window is teeny, teeny, tiny, or you can have the window very, very large. So now we have the trigger response curve, which is pretty much just like mouse acceleration, but for the analog trigger. Now it's not quite like mouse acceleration. Mouse acceleration applies a multiplier that will change the acceleration or the velocity of your cursor based on the actual mouse's physical movement across a surface. And it, depending on the speed, it will apply either a greater than a one-to-one -one ratio or uh, less than a one-to-one -one ratio. With the trigger response curve, you pick whether or not you want to do a greater than a one-to-one -one ratio or less than a one-to-one -one ratio. There's actually only one option for doing greater than a one-to-one -one ratio, and I'll try to explain this in a way that makes sense. So say you have a graph here, and say you have speed, and distance. So you have speed and distance, a one-to-one -one ratio would look like that, and say you would end up there on the screen. If the software is assuming greater than a one-to-one -one ratio, if you apply the aggressive response curve, it's going to do greater than this one-to-one -one ratio in terms of the speed and hopefully the distance that you end up. So you might actually end up somewhere like the speed goes up right away and you end up over here as your distance because the speed increased and the velocity increased and now you end up over here. With uh, the relaxed and the wide and extra wide, what it actually does is for each one it applies uh, a less than a one-to-one -one ratio. So one might look like that, one might look like that, one might look like that. 
Now, the aggressive will probably send you the greatest distance, but it's probably going to be the hardest one to control. Uh, one to one ratio is probably what you'd want to have it set to by default, the linear uh, option. But that's basically how these parameters work. You would have relaxed, and that, or I guess this would be relaxed, and then that would be wide, and this one would be extra wide. It would go, it would take a very long time to reach the uh, the maximum distance, you know, yeah, <laughs> or the uh, the maximum output. So I hope that made sense. How this affects the game would be. If you're the type of person that likes to hammer down the trigger, but you actually don't want to hammer down the trigger, like you, you want to be able to physically do that because it's comfortable for you to hammer down the trigger, but if the game doesn't respond well to that, you might want to change the response curve. Maybe if you set it to extra wide, you could slam down the trigger and you won't get such a re an exaggerated response from the game, if that makes sense. Like, if you have it set to aggressive and you're a really heavy-handed person and you're trying to do precise movements, it might be dif difficult if you're using aggressive. You might overshoot. It may it'd be very difficult to control. But if you're a heavy-handed person and you know it and the game isn't responding well to you, you might actually be better off with one of these more relaxed settings or the extra wide setting. So I'm not actually going to go over the bumpers too much because like the grip buttons, they're actually just inputs. They're not variable, they're not analog. If you look at them, they just want you to assign an input to them. They're just a button. They're like the button pad, pretty much. I could probably just go over the trackpad first and just start off with the first parameter, the directional pad. All right, you choose directional pad, you get a template for a directional pad which you can assign an input to. So you've basically turned the trackpad into a direction pad. So you can assign whatever input you want. You can decide whether or not you require a click to actually actuate an input. So if you're pressing up, you can just touch it. If this is set to off, you would just touch it. You touch the pad and then it would register whatever input you wanted. If you set it to on, you have to actually click the button in order to get it to uh, perform the action that you're intending. Now the layout is kind of interesting because there's a few different ones. The radial without overlap is probably the easiest one to illustrate first. Say you have a circle. Basically how this relates to the trackpad is that the circle is divided into a pi and you have up right, down, and left on the pi. This is radial without overlap. You can't actuate either of these two inputs at the same time. But if you set it to radial with overlap, all of a sudden you get these regions between the keys or between the inputs that actually will actuate both keys or both inputs at the same time. So if you're anywhere within this radius on the pi, both of the inputs, like a directional pad, will be actuated at the same time. Analog emulation. Basically what this does is it tries its best to emulate an analog stick in a way. That's the best that I can kind of get out of it. Wherein if you have a directional pad, it chops it up into an even greater um, pie. And as best as I can tell, each one of these chunks in this pie is referred to by the software as a pulse. And you can cut this up as many times as the software will let you. You go to analog emulation, and then you go to the advanced settings, and then you have the analog emulation pulse time which I think is the frequency, the, the, the number of chunks in this pie that you can play with. And you can set however many you want, or as many as the software will let you. And each one of these will be, it almost acts like a gradient. Instead of having four, four or eight big chunks in a pie for the directional pad, 
you will have a, a gigantic gradient. And I've never actually used this. I can't really find a use for it, but this is how I'm figure, figuring it works because I can't really think of a different way that it could possibly work. And the emulation active percentage Basically, another way that you can think of the analog emulation pulse time and the analog emulation active percentage would be, say here is a single interval where it's sending information to the game. You can set however many of these you want, and one interval is equal to one of these slices in the pie. Now, how much of this time, if you think of it in time, the analog emulation active percentage is how much of this time do you want it to be occupied by the actual input? Very little? Do you want half of it? Do you want the entire thing to be occupied with, with the input? Basically, what that would allow you to do is that if you're, if you're using the direction pad and you rotate to a certain point and you keep it there, do you will it stop sending input until you move your finger again, or will it continue sending input when you're at that point? Like I said, the software explains these things really, really poorly, and this is the best extrapolation that I can possibly get for this particular parameter, because they really don't throw you a bone with this. This is, <laughs> this is the best that I could do to try to explain it. And then you have the cross gate, which basically turns the trackpad into this. Where this is a dead zone, this is a dead zone, that's a dead zone, and that's a dead zone, and all you have is up, right, down, and left. That's it. And it's in the shape of a cross, so these areas in between do fuck all. That's basically what it means. So now we have the click action, which allows you to assign an input to the click that's underneath the trackpad, very self-explanatory. We have the dead zone. And as far as I can tell, this applies an inner dead zone, not an outer dead zone. So if you have your trackpad and it's divided up like a directional pad, it'll apply an inner dead zone, a point at which no information is going to the game. Uh, let's take a look again at the advanced settings. It also has turbo mode, and I've already explained how that's useful. We have outer ring binding radius and outer ring binding. Basically, what these do, I'm not entirely sure how applicable they are to a, di to a direction pad, but in the context of the trackpad, what the outer ring binding does is that once you get to the edge, it'll perform a different action and you can assign whichever action you want once you get to the edge of the trackpad and you can actually assign the radius so if you have your trackpad you can change the radius so if you're moving your thumb along the trackpad and then you hit the outer ring binding radius then that input will register to the game for a direction pad Maybe uh, a use for this would be if you're actually using the direction pad to move around the environment, but you want to get when you get to the edge, you want your character to sprint. Maybe you can apply shift if shift is your sprint key. You can go to the outer ring binding and then apply shift so that when you get to the edge of the trackpad, it'll hit shift and it will also send information about your direction. So now you can sprint and, and use the direction pad at the same time. And that's what that's for. The outer ring binding invert, basically what that does, you can think of the outer ring binding radius as the, out, as the outer dead zone. So you have two dead zones on a trackpad. You have the inner dead zone and then you have the outer dead zone. Pretty much what the outer ring binding radius does is once you get to the outer dead zone or the edge of the outer dead zone, it will apply whatever parameter you want. When you turn on the outer ring binding invert, it'll actually use the inner dead zone instead. So that when it's in the resting position, a certain parameter will be applied. 
and if it's not inverted, when you get to the outer dead zone, a certain input or parameter will be applied, and I hope that makes sense. All right, so now we have the button pad. The button pad is a little different. Uh, you can basically turn the trackpad into another button pad if you want. I'm not sure why you'd do that, but if you wanted to, you could. You can assign any input you want to the button pad. It has uh, hold to repeat and repeat interval exa exactly the same as before. It require click, whether or not you just want to touch the trackpad or you actually want to physically click it, you can assign that. The button radius and button distance is interesting. And I'll explain what these do. The button radius, say that's your trackpad. If you want your button to be this big on the trackpad, you can. You'd set the button radius pretty small. If you wanted it to be very large on the surface of the trackpad, you'd set the button radius larger. And you have four buttons, and you can actually set these as large as you want, or as small as you want, right? Now, you got to be careful because you actually can get these buttons so big that they overlap. And with a, it's not like a direction pad where that's actually desirable in some cases. With a button pad, that's almost never desirable. So you have to be very careful when you're setting the button radius to where they're actually not overlapping. And I wish that Steam uh, or Valve offered you a visual aid for how big the buttons were um, relative to the parameters that you're setting. And that would be very convenient, but they don't, so you kind of have to just wing it. So say there's your trackpad. The button distance is how far the buttons are away from each other on the X and Y axis, basically. So you can have one button over here, one over here, one over here, one over here, or you can have a bigger one right there, bigger one right there, and they can actually bleed off the edge of the trackpad as well. So you can set the distance and the size, and that's what these two parameters do. And if you've been reading the screen while I've been talking, you'll probably see this test haptics enable on and off. This is leftover garbage that's actually still just in the Steam software and doesn't do anything. I've tested it, I've enabled it, I've changed it, I've changed all of these parameters, nothing happens. At least nothing with the haptics that I've noticed happens. So I think these are just useless. They're left over and the, uh, the descriptions are actually just file names. So I'm assuming that they don't really do anything at all. So that's the button pad. Moving on, we have the mouse. Now this is where we really start to have fun. Because there are a whole whack of parameters to assign for the mouse. Of course, you have the click action, self-explanatory. You click the uh, trackpad and you can actuate whatever input you want. The sensitivity, generally when you're assigning the mouse uh, to the trackpad, you want the game's mouse sensitivity to be down as far as possible because you're using the Steam software to handle the sensitivity because you're actually changing the sensitivity of the device itself. And it gives it more information to work with if you actually reduce the sensitivity in the game. So if you're having sensitivity issues and you're using the mouse input parameter, well, you might actually have the in-game sensitivity set too high. So if you could reduce that and try it again, you might actually find that you have an improvement because the software just has more information to work with when this the actual game sensitivity is low. The rotation is probably the most important parameter for the Steam controller in actually getting it to feel comfortable. And it took me a long time to actually figure out exactly where my rotation sits. Mine personally, I find the center point and generally I go one, two, three, four, and that's where I'm comfortable. But some people have more of a skewed grip where they're almost vertical when they're, when they're flipping the camera around. Basically what the rotation does, I neglected to explain, it sets the horizontal midpoint of the trackpad. So it sets it either like this or like that. It changes it. And basically what it's trying to do is accommodate your grip because if, if you look at the way I'm holding the controller, if I flick across the horizon, if I'm moving my character and my camera horizontally, if I'm flicking, it's not actually a straight line. It's skewed off to the side. 
right? I, I was playing with a straight line, but then I found that when I, when I was in a situation where I had to think fast and I was using my reflexes more than my brain, I was actually skewed. So it became more comfortable for me over time to actually apply a little bit of a skewed grip. And that's the rotation. And now you have mouse acceleration. And what mouse acceleration does is it basically applies a multiplier to the input that the computer is getting from the device as the device travels. So if it's a mouse traveling across the surface or if it's a trackpad receiving information based on the speed of your thumb moving across its surface, it will apply a multiplier that will either move the mouse slower than a one-to-one -one ratio or quicker than a one-to-one -one ratio depending on how fast the actual physical object that is controlling the input w is moving. So if we have speed and distance, that would be a one-to-one -one ratio right there. But say we end up moving our thumb very, very slowly across the trackpad well, you, we might be moving it slow enough that it's starting to apply a less than a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So your speed might start to drop off and you might not actually cover the same distance. The, and now the inverse is true, that if you increase your speed dramatically, you might actually boost your speed way up and increase your distance overall. Now one of these is moving faster than a one-to-one -one ratio, one of these is moving slower than a one-to-one -one ratio. That should actually, that curve should actually be low like that. It should not be in that direction, it should be in this direction. So that would be lower than a one-to-one -one ratio, this would be higher than a one-to-one -one ratio. The idea is you want to be able to travel less distance by moving your thumb slower. And what this can do is it can offer precision because if you're using your iron sight and you're zooming in on a target and you're finding that your thumb is really, really janky and it's buzzing around all over the place and you can't get an accurate shot, well, you're trying to move your thumb slowly, but it's still sending very sensitive information to the game. So what mouse acceleration can do is it can help you tone down some of that information when you're moving your thumb very, very slowly and you're trying to get a headshot and you're using a sniper rifle at 400 yards. You know, you can, you can actually move your thumb very, very slowly and you'll get an even slower response from the game. And that's what mouse acceleration is for. Now the inverse is true and it might be undesirable where the quicker you move it, the faster the, the input will, will actually move in the game. Now that might be undesirable as well. Maybe you want acceleration that's lower than a one-to-one -one ratio but you don't want the acceleration to go higher than a one-to-one -one ratio. Unfortunately, there's no way to do this in the mouse acceleration parameters here, but there is kind of a way to get it done, and I'll cover that when I go into the advanced settings. So trackball mode. Trackball mode is basically the trackpad emulating a trackball. Those really old mice from the early 90s, late 80s, where you have a ball on the surface and it's suspended in a chassis, and when you roll the ball, it'll continue sending information because the ball is heavy. It'll continue rolling and sending information to the computer and the actual cursor will move across the screen, even if you're not touching the ball anymore. So that's what it emulates. And that's extremely useful for camera mechanics, being able to move around and, and move your camera, either moving a crosshair or moving your camera around a character or being first person and looking around the environment, it's really useful to be able to have the trackball. And it's one of the first things that Valve actually explored when building the Steam Controller. Their original prototype had a trackball in it, but they found that it was way too heavy, uh, so they scrapped it immediately and went straight for doing trackball emulation. But you can set the trackball friction, and the friction is basically um, how fast you want it to stop or how far you want it to swing. 
the lower the friction, the longer it'll take for the ball to stop, and the more motion you will get from the initial velocity of your swing. So you swing the camera and it'll keep spinning, and if you set it to low friction, it'll spin really fast, and then it'll slow down. If you set the friction to high and you swipe, it'll spin a little bit and it'll slow down quickly. And these are very useful parameters, and I really strongly encourage that if you're having trouble um, moving your camera around or aiming, try enabling one of the trackball options. So here we have the friction vertical scale, and it works in conjunction with the trackball friction like this. You could think of the trackball's movement like this. You have time, and then you have velocity. The trackball when you flick your thumb across the surface gives information to the game and then it starts to slow down the trackball. This right here, this slope where it starts to slow down is referred to as the decay. This plateau is referred to as the sustain. So basically what the trackball friction does is it alters the decay, how quickly the trackball slows down. If you set it to low, it'll take a long time. If you set it to medium, it'll take a shorter amount of time. If you set it to high, it'll take an even shorter amount of time. Now this right here is the sustain. And this is the parameter that is altered by the friction vertical scale. But the friction vertical scale works like this. If it's dead in the middle, like it is right now, the horizontal and vertical axis will be identical they will be 50-50. That means the sustain will be the same on both the vertical and horizontal axis, right? However, if you, re if you reduce this value to where the vertical scale is small, but the horizontal scale is large, what this will do is it will chop down the sustain for the vertical scale, and it will extend the sustain for the horizontal scale. And the inverse is correct as well. Say you set it balls to the wall, you can have it look like that as well, where the vertical scale, or the vertical axis rather, is high in sustain, but the horizontal axis will be lower in sustain. So this chunk, this plateau on the graph, will actually shrink or expand depending on how you have these parameters configured. And here we have uh, invert vertical axis. Basically, that takes um, the top and bottom information here, the up and down, and it just flips them. It inverts them. Some people like to play with an inverted camera, and this is where you set it up. You can probably also set it up in the game, but if funny things happen and it's more convenient to set it up in the software, they give you that option. So we'll go into the advanced settings, and here's where stuff really starts to get interesting. You have this sensitivity vertical scale, which is essentially the same thing that I described before, where it's set to 50-50. You can either shorten the vertical scale and extend the horizontal scale, or you can lengthen the vertical scale and shorten the horizontal scale. You can do it either way. And this is actually useful because in some shooters, you really do want to be able to look left and right faster than you look up and down. And that makes sense, because exploring the horizon line with your camera is something that you're going to be doing frequently, and you don't want to really accidentally look up very easily, uh, because that can happen every once in a while. So you can actually set the sensitivity vertical scale to favor horizontal movement over vertical movement. So that's actually pretty useful when, config when configuring the game for first-person or third-person shooters where you want the camera to behave in that fashion. Uh, touch binding, you can actually have it uh, to, you can actually have it bind an input to just touching the trackpad and you can also have an input uh, to where you click the trackpad. The trigger press mouse dampening, basically what the trigger press mouse dampening is is that when you actuate a button and you can pick which button you want to use to actuate this particular uh, parameter, it will dampen all of the sensitivity settings that you've assigned to the trackpad. So say this is your iron sight and this is your trigger, 
and you're using your camera and it works just fine and everything's cool, but the second you engage your iron sight and begin to look, well, maybe the mouse is just a way too sensitive and you can't really get a precise shot. Well, you can actually engage the mouse dampening and reduce the amount of sensitivity, the, the overall sensitivity. All of your other parameters will remain the same, but the overall sensitivity will be reduced, and that's to increase the precision of aiming with an iron sight. You have the smoothing. Uh, basically what the smoothing does is it smooths out all of the extra superfluous information coming off your thumb. Because your thumb doesn't move across this surface in a very linear fashion. If you looked at the movement of your thumb across the surface, it, it's, it, it's going to have spots where it, it swells up in movement and it's going to have spots where it's, you know, uh, jagged like this. Basically what mouse smoothing does is it cuts off all of the janky information to where the information that gets through is the really relevant information. So it smooths out the, the, the mouse responsiveness. And usually having it set to 50-50 is sufficient, but if you're still getting a little bit of janky play out of your mouse, you might increase it a bit. If you're noticing that the mouse is also uh, janky but increasing it makes it worse, uh, there's probably too much smoothing and you can reduce it as well. So the double tap binding is pretty much just a double click, but you can actually change the duration. And the duration is how long after the first click will the second click actually enable whatever parameter you have assigned to it. So if you set this really low, you'll have to double click really fast. If you set this really high, you can get a double click clicking it relatively slowly. You can also set it to beep. The controller will beep uh, once the double tap has been registered. You can configure that. It's a really weird feature and I don't know why but I guess they wanted people to be able to distinguish between a single tap and a double tap. But you couldn't do it with haptics, so they needed to go a step further and add a beep. And this is actually the only parameter that includes a beep. It's really strange. So here we have edge spin radius and edge spin speed. Basically what this does is that you can think of this as your trackpad. There is a radius around the edge of the trackpad that will continue sending information from the trackpad as long as your thumb is still at the edge of the trackpad. If it's anywhere within this radius along the edge of the trackpad, it will continue sending uh, information. So if you're moving your thumb and your thumb stops at the edge, say you're moving your camera, you move your camera all along here and then you stop at the edge, it'll continue moving the camera even though you're at the edge. The reason this is here is the controller, the trackpads look pretty big. I mean, for a controller, they're actually like, they look like they're pretty large, but in some games they can actually feel pretty small. So what Valve did is said, oh, okay, well, we can, what we can do is we can extend the surface area of the trackpad, basically, by allowing you to continue sending input even though you've reached the edge. You've reached the physical limit of the trackpad, but it's still not impossible for you to continue moving your camera or your character or whatever, even though you're at the edge. And it's a useful feature. And you can set the speed, and the speed is self-explanatory. The higher it is, the faster the edge speed will move. Uh, the radius just controls the thickness, and that's pretty much how that works. So right here we have the minimum movement threshold. And this is what I was gonna be talking about earlier where I was on this screen and I was going over the mouse acceleration and I was saying, well, the mouse acceleration applies a multiplier to both greater and lesser than a one-to-one -one ratio. But what if you want just want less than a one-to-one -one ratio? What if you want this to behave differently when you're moving below a one-to-one -one ratio? And you can kind of emulate this a little bit because you don't want it going above a one-to-one -one ratio and then losing control, but you might like the precision of under a one-to-one -one ratio. So you can actually set the mouse acceleration to off completely and then go over here and set the minimum movement threshold. And this can actually help you get that precision back. 
that you'd get from having the mouse move at a less than a one-to-one -one ratio. You can get some of this precision back. The higher you set this, the more physical movements you will need across the trackpad to get the same amount of input in the game. So, say you're, you have a cursor and it's, and it's sat in the middle of the screen and you're moving your thumb and your thumb is, you know, everybody's, everybody's thumb has a little bit of movement to it when it's even resting. And this is sensitive enough to pick that up. So you don't want all of that superfluous data making your crosshair janky on the screen and making it go all over the place. So what the minimum movement threshold does is it acts kind of like mouse smoothing in that it removes all of that superfluous information and sets a minimum movement threshold exactly as the name implies. And what this can do is that it can actually smooth out your movement to where maybe you want the cro your crosshair is exactly where it needs to be but your thumb is still on the trackpad. Depending on where you have this threshold configured, those little tiny movements on the trackpad that are intrusive might not actually uh, register to the game. The controller might, act not, might not actually be sending that information to the game depending on where you have this parameter configured. It is probably one of the most important parameters to configure when you're using an iron sight and fire uh, configuration when you're playing a first person shooter. You definitely want to fiddle around with the minimum movement threshold a little bit in order to get uh, the best results possible. So now we have mouse joystick and what this is for is for games that either don't have keyboard and mouse support at all, or they have no support for simultaneous use of a keyboard and mouse and a controller. So if you have a game that can't use both of them at the same time, mouse joystick is the best workaround for using a mouse in a game that only wants you to be using a joystick. So what it does is it takes the information from the trackpad the mouse information and it converts it to analog stick information for the game to interpret basically. And it's it feels a little weird and it's definitely not ideal but it is the best possible workaround for that particular problem. So we have rotation, we have sensitivity vertical scale, we have haptics, we have, we have everything we've already gone over. So in the advanced settings we have trigger press mouse dampening. We've already gone over that. We've already gone uh, over double tap binding and edge spin radius. The minimum joystick speed for the X and Y axes. Um, basically what this is, is the mouse joysticks version of mouse smoothing. And what it does is I think it increases the polling rate of the mouse uh, for the game to interpret. So it sends more information to the game. So if you have a certain number of uh, intervals with one setting, you can actually increase the number of intervals over the same period of time, right? So you, you can actually increase the sensitivity, not necessarily the sensitivity, but you can increase the fidelity of the movement by adjusting these values. So if the fidelity is really low, like if the number of intervals the gamepad is actually sending to the game is low, you can actually see noticeable stutter and janky movement on the screen. And if you set these higher, you can actually remove that by increasing the number of movement, uh, or increasing the number of intervals at which the controller is sending information to the game. So that's the output value. How, how much output do you want the game to be receiving? If you set it really high, you might get more smooth experience. If you set it too high, it might become janky again. There's a sweet spot for both axes, and it's just up to you to configure the software and try to find them. We have joystick move. Joystick move, basically, you set the output whichever output you want. You can have the left joystick. Normally a controller has two joysticks, so you can set it to uh, the output either left or right. So even though you're moving the left uh, joystick, if the game is expecting an Xbox 360 controller where there's another joystick, you can set it so that controlling this one will actually control the other joystick on the Xbox 360 controller.
relative mouse. Uh, basically what that does is it allows you to put your cursor anywhere within a radius and the radius is determined by the actual uh, joystick itself and the the mouse will be confined to that particular radius and you can extend the radius and decrease the radius based on uh, I think it's dead zone parameters and you can go over those but that's a relative mouse absolute mouse is basically where you are here's your screen if you're moving the joystick around you are flooring your cursor along the edge of the screen and this is a this sounds stupid but it's actually useful in some situations like say a top-down uh, dungeon crawler like uh, Diablo 3 if you're trying to create a custom uh, control scheme for Diablo 3 well you might actually get some use out of having the mouse floored against the screen to try to get it out of the way as much as possible so you don't accidentally, accidentally click on something but you can still move your character around so some, something like that it might be useful to have that enabled so output axis basically what this setting does is you have your joystick movement this is the full range of movement in the with the joystick you can either slice it this way to where there's 180 degrees of movement on that side and 180 degrees of movement on this side and you will only get left and right within these two chunks of the pie or you can completely flip that around and have it the other way where you have 180 degrees on the top and bottom and you will only get up and down that's basically what the output axis controls go into advanced settings uh, you have adaptive centering which also works for the trackpad this works actually pretty much exclusively for the trackpad adaptive centering is wherever you put your thumb is the new center of the trackpad and this is useful for certain situations like uh, in my last video I said that in grid autosport I had the trackpad set to my gear shifter my sequential uh, manual transmission now, I don't always put my thumb down in the same spot, especially if I'm getting into it and I'm moving the controller around. I don't always put my thumb down in the same spot. So having adaptive centering is actually useful because I can actually still put my thumb against the edge. I can put it up here. And as long as I'm swiping either up or down, it will register wherever I have my thumb as the new center, right? Until your thumb is lifted. And then wherever you put it down next, that's the new center. So it's actually really, really useful. Uh, invert horizontal and vertical axes, mouse sensitivity, that's self-explanatory. The stick response curve, I already went over that earlier on in the video. It's the exact same thing as the, uh, the trigger response curve. And since they're both analog in pretty much the exact same way, uh, it still applies. You have aggressive, relaxed, wide, and extra wide. If you need a refresh uh, as to how that works, go back to the analog trigger part of the video and you can learn about that the dead zone shape this is actually important this is interesting you have say this is your trackpad or your uh, joystick you can set up the dead zones to be a bunch of different shapes and you might think that if you set it to cross or circle rather that it just puts a dead zone in the middle but that's not actually the case there's also a dead zone around the perimeter as well and you can set the inner and outer dead zone right here. Uh, by default, there is no inner dead zone, so it's completely removed. Uh, and the outer dead zone is at half. So if you set it to cross, pretty much what that does is that is if this is your trackpad, you have a shape like this, and that's a dead zone, that's a dead zone, that's a dead zone, that's a dead zone. But if you set the inner dead zone Whoop. If you set the inner dead zone up, it'll start putting a cross-shaped dead zone. So that if you're actually touching anywhere inside that dead zone, it's not sending information to the computer. Which, I can't really find a use for it. So, if you're setting it to cross shape, probably best to leave the inner dead zone off, just so you don't make any mistakes. The outer dead zone is more than sufficient for offering that cross-shaped accuracy on the trackpad. And square... Square is an interesting idea because then you have a square-shaped um, radius in the middle, 
and all of this is a dead zone, all of this is a dead zone, and all of that, and all of this. And you might think, why is this useful? Well, it exaggerates diagonals. It's a lot, you get a lot more output out of the diagonals than you do out of the horizontal and vertical axes. These actually go further toward the edges. And that can actually be useful for some games, like maybe even a game like uh, Platformer. It could be very useful for where if you're jumping, you know, you want to be able to hit that diagonal if the diagonal in the game is set to jump. Some platformers are like that. If you want an exaggerated um, diagonal for something like that, it would probably be useful to have something like that. So the anti-dead zone, pretty much what this does is that if the game has a dead zone on the trackpad already that you can't seem to get rid of, it's there by default, what this does is it basically extends the usable surface of the trackpad outward past the actual physical edge of the trackpad. So it, it basically pushes the game's dead zone off of the physical surface, if that makes sense. So if you have a game and you notice that when you get over to right here on the trackpad, you're not getting any input, and no matter how you tweak the settings in here, it's still not working, um, chances are pretty good that the game has a built-in dead zone that uh, is inhibiting your movement in some way. And what you can do is you can actually set this anti-dead zone to push that area off of the edge of the trackpad. So now the entire thing is usable surface for input. Now, this might not actually be a good thing because what if, uh, what if you want the dead zone? What if you want to have your own dead zone? But you don't want to use the game's dead zone. Well, you use the anti-dead zone buffer and what this does is it, it reapplies your own dead zone so that you can fine tune exactly where it is easier. And that's probably the best that I can explain it. So now we have joystick camera. Joystick camera works pretty much, it's, it basically it's expecting the right analog stick, but we don't have one. Uh, you have your output, you have your stick response curve, because what it's doing is it's emulating a, 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 an analog stick. But if you're actually assigning it over here, you don't need to emulate it, you actually have an analog stick. So now we have the scroll wheel, which kind of behaves in a unique way. We can set this to either the horizontal or vertical axis, so we can use the horizontal axis like our mouse scroll wheel, or we can use the vertical axis like our mouse scroll wheel, or we can set it for a circular motion, which allows you to use the outside perimeter of the trackpad like your scroll wheel. And it doesn't function dissimilarly to an original iPod where you're going around the perimeter of the button pad and you're actually able to scroll through menus. It's pretty much the same principle. You can set the direction uh, to clockwise or counterclockwise, or you can invert the vertical or horizontal axes. You can set a, a clockwise binding to where if you move to uh, a clockwise motion, it will actuate a certain control, and uh, same with counterclockwise. If you move around the perimeter in that direction, it'll trigger a different action. And the mouse wheel click action is pretty much just the click of the actual uh, trackpad underneath. And then we have the list, the scroll wheel list, and you can assign whatever inputs you want to any of these. So say you're playing a game like Unreal Tournament, right? And you're assigning this trackpad to a scroll wheel. You can actually assign numbers one through zero because Unreal Tournament has 10 weapons. You can go one through zero, fill up this list with all of your weapons. And as you scroll through the trackpad, you will have access to your weapons very quickly. And you will go you know, from one side to the other, maybe flat cannons over here, maybe bio rifles over here, and you can really get some quick action out of it and you can weapon swap in a game that actually doesn't have 10 inputs that doesn't allow you to weapon swap very fast you can set it up to weapon swap really 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 quickly using the scroll wheel and I think that's a really amazing feature now we're on to touch menu and I think this is probably one of the most overlooked features on the steam controller and a lot of people probably go through all of the inputs and they get to touch menu and they're like ah oh, that sounds confusing I don't really want to mess with that like I don't really want to get into it but it's actually really really useful 
basically what it does is it allows you to open up an actual menu on the screen and assign however many inputs you want to it. So right now uh, I have it set to four, it's four in the software, but I think you have a maximum of 16 buttons that you can assign to this menu that will actually come up on the screen. Right now, because I'm using the right trackpad, it's set to the lower right-hand side of the screen. So the horizontal position is closer to the right and the vertical position uh, for this, higher means lower. So it's on the lower right-hand side of the screen you have the touch menu activation style. So do you want the menu to come up when you're just touching the trackpad with your thumb or are you clicking the trackpad? Um, do you want to be able to select your uh, input based on just touch release or button release? So if you set it to button release, you'll touch the trackpad and hold down the button but it won't actually select an input off of the menu until you release the button. Touch release, you just have to brush the trackpad and then take your thumb off to select an input. So we have four inputs. You can actually just set these up. Say, say uh, you're playing a first person shooter and these are four guns. This would be useful maybe for a game like uh, Borderlands where you have four weapons to choose from and only four weapons to choose from. And you can actually set those uh, up in the uh, in the menu right here so you have inputs one through four and then you can choose to display the label on them you can adjust the opacity which is how transparent the actual menu is if you want to be able to see mostly through it if you want it to be completely opaque so where you can't see through it you can adjust that you can adjust the menu size you can make it smaller you can make it larger it's um, pretty low resolution by default, so making it smaller might be a little bit more pleasing to the eye. In the advanced settings, uh, it's basically just more inputs. So if I was to actually use this for a game, you'd see a menu come up and then you can hover over one of these inputs and then select it. For mouse region, most region pretty much just allows you to bind areas of your screen to areas of the trackpad. Uh, and you have a click binding for the, uh, the click underneath. You have a touch binding for when you just want to touch the trackpad. And you can set the region size. Kind of similarly to how you could set the region size for the button pad, you can set the region size for uh, the mouse region as well. And what this does basically, if I, it's really hard to describe, based on the size of the region determines where the mouse will move. So if you're using this as a camera, never use this as a camera. But if you are using this as a camera, um, you can actually assign different areas of your field of vision to uh, different areas on the trackpad and you adjust um, exactly how far you want to look in any given direction by adjusting the region size. Now you would never want to use this as a camera but it might be useful for a game like a top-down you know game like how to survive or Diablo 3 you know a top-down game where maybe you do want to keep the mouse slightly confined but you still want it around your character and you want to be able to move your character in a direction similarly to a direction pad this would probably be the best option to choose for it but you'd have to do a lot of tweaking to get it to work comfortably I still haven't actually personally found a use for it and that's why I'm kind of at a, at a, at a loss for things to say about it uh, the, the snap mouse back on stop basically what that is is when you touch the trackpad, it'll put the mouse in an area of the screen, and when you release, based on what parameter you have set here, it will return the mouse to a resting position, be like center, for example. Uh, the gyro is pretty much the only thing that's left, but there isn't a whole lot to say about it other than you can assign all of the same parameters to it, but instead of moving your thumb across the trackpad, you're actually moving the device in three-dimensional space in order to move the mouse around on the screen. So if you choose mouse, you have 
acceleration, which works exactly how I explained before. Um, you can set the enable button. So if you only want the gyro enabled some of the time, say that this is your iron sight and you want to be able to use the gyro to aim, you can set the, uh, let's find it. You can set the left trigger full pull to the gyro enable so that once this is pulled, the gyro will enable and you will be able to aim and shoot with your right trigger using the gyro. And then once you let go, the gyro disengages and then you're back to just playing like a normal controller. Set the sensitivity and the rotation for the gyro is different than the rotation for the trackpad. If you're the type of person who sits, you're kind of skewed to one side a little bit, you can actually set the rotation and it's pretty self-explanatory. By default, it's centered. Gyro lean left binding and gyro lean right binding are basically uh, inputs that you can assign to jerking the controller in a particular direction. And how you jerk the controller is controlled here. You can either do yaw or you can do roll where you're moving it like a steering wheel. You get to choose how you move this particular axis. The gyro lean point is the actuation threshold for the bindings. So just like there was an actuation threshold for the analog trigger, there's an actuation threshold for the movement left and right. So you actually set the lean point right here and you set the, uh, the threshold for that actuation along a gradient right here. And the minimum movement threshold works in the same way. Say you're finding it very difficult to use the gyro and get really precise aiming because the, the cursor's kind of buzzing everywhere. Well, you can actually set the minimum movement threshold and try to remove all of that superfluous information, which is actually pretty bloody useful. So that's pretty much the uh, Steam Controller in a nutshell. It is a very large nutshell, indeed. <laughs> but uh, that's it. I hope you found what I have given you useful. I hope I've explained a few things. I hope I've clarified a few things. And I hope you really end up getting full functionality out of this device now that you have a little bit of a better understanding as to what all of the input parameters do. Because some of them, oh my god, they're worded so poorly, and there are so many spelling mistakes in the software. I hate to admit it, but Valve really disappointed me when it came to the layout of the software and how the software explains what the parameters do. It's really frustrating. The actual software, like, from a functional standpoint, is fine. You click on the input and you can assign things. It's actually really, really good. But the explanations that it gives you at the top here are just extremely subpar and insufficient, and a video like the one I'm doing is fucking necessary for understanding this shit, which actually shouldn't be the case. They should be clear and understood just by reading the descriptions, but they're not. So I really, really hope that I've helped you with this video. So as I was editing, I discovered that I completely neglected to talk about mode shifting, so I'll talk about that briefly right now. Basically, what it allows you to do is to assign an input like say so let's go to left trigger full pull and what it'll do is it'll let you switch what type of input method you're using for that particular input so now this is um, the right trackpad so I can switch this to something else so if I go back to the original <coughs> uh, input method which is the mouse and say I have mouse acceleration set to high, I have track mo or track ball set to medium, I have the friction vertical scale over here, like say I have all of these parameters edited differently, I can go to the mode shifting and I, all these parameters will change to something else. So say if you're aiming and you don't want mouse acceleration at all and you're holding down the left trigger for your iron sight and you're aiming, uh, you can choose to have it turn off the mouse acceleration as an option for the mode shifting. Or, for example, like if you're playing GTA 5, which uses mouse joystick by default, and you wanted more precision while you're aiming, you can set the mode shifting to mouse, and that'll give you a little bit more precision, because using the mouse is a little bit more precise than using mouse joystick for aiming. So that's something that you could do with it as well.